Welcome everyone to Beautiful Black Books presented by Poetry Center San Jose with host Santa Clara County Poet Laureate Shaka Campbell and today featuring Henry Jones. My name is Robert Pesich, president of Poetry Center San Jose. We'll begin today's program with a land acknowledgement and some information about upcoming events. So let's get to it here. We acknowledge that the city of San Jose is made up of the unceded territory of the Moekma Ohlone tribe who trace their ancestry through the local mission system. We remember and acknowledge that this land was taken through violence and dishonesty. We remember the connection the Ohlone people have to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to continue to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment now of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and present. Thank you. And now some words for our supporters. Poetry Center San Jose is a member supported organization and is funded in part by grants from Applied Materials Foundation, the City of San Jose's Office of Cultural Affairs, Knight Foundation, Poets and Writers, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, SV Creates in partnership with the County of Santa Clara and the California Arts Council and supported in part by a SV Creates National Endowment of the Arts American Rescue Plan grant. We also thank Ann and Mark's Art Party and Brandenburg Family Foundation for their generous giving. Please submit a quick survey about this event to help us improve our logistics and content and report to our funders and supporters. I'll be putting the link for the survey in the chat. And now for some upcoming events at Poetry Center San Jose, which includes the eighth annual San Jose Poetry Festival returning to in-person venues this year, aha, to celebrate the living and lively poetry of San Jose, Santa Clara County, and the greater Bay Area. This year's festival will also focus on celebrating the reemergence of downtown San Jose. We will see the insides of new businesses like Mama Kin, and Nirvana Soul, new to us spaces like the Tabard Theater and spaces we've called home for decades like Gallery Anna Domini. Poets, writers, facilitators include veteran local poets like Poetry Slam and spoken word experts Chris Loxon, Seven Kelly Bolt, Danny Tinlet, and Kim Johnson and David Perez, who have each helped to build the spoken word and literary community we know today along with many other local artists and writers. On Saturday, September 10th, our marquee event will celebrate the future of local poetry with Santa Clara County's three new youth poet laureates, Poets Laureate, and will be hosted by our new Santa Clara County Poet Laureate, Shaka Campbell. The Small Press Fair returns this year, outdoors at the picnic tables in the Center of History Park, close to our home, Markham House. So bring your lunch, join us for a lovely morning in the sun with eclectic groups of publishers, editors, poets, spoken word artists and writers. And the festival closes Sunday, September 11th with San Francisco poet laureate Tongo Eisen Martin, helping us to usher in a new era and the new home of the San Jose Poetry Slam. That at the Tabard Theater. You can find individual event tickets, workshop tickets, or a full festival pass at bit.ly forward slash PCSJTIX. That's bit.ly forward slash PCSJTIX. All right. Now, uh, you know, if you want to support Poetry Center with a membership, uh, and, you know, with membership comes Sejura, uh, our literary magazine, and discounts to workshops and events. Just visit pcsj.org. That's it for me now. I'm going to 
give it to Shaka and Henry. There we Can go. Can you guys hear me? Can yeah. you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So, you know, just for, for the, the, the public out there, um, apologies in advance. Uh, my, you know, technology is great when it's working. Um, my internet in the entire area has um, gone down, but the show must go on. So, um, and I've been waiting for this for a long time to talk to his brother. So um, we are going to push through it. If it gets too difficult, we may have to uh, find other other ways. But um, again, you you don't know till you try, right? So I just want to give that little bit of a, a preface before we go through. But welcome everyone to uh, Beautiful Black Books brought to you by Poetry San Jose. Now this is a reoccurring program featuring Black writers in conversation followed by Q&A. Um, it's basically a vessel. The, the aim of this is that we want to bring Black writers to our communities and our communities to these writers to learn a little bit more about you know, their sources of inspiration, um, things that were uh, formative in them becoming who they are today. So again, spending some time to sort of get behind the curtain with some of these artists. So um, a bit about our guest of honor today, Henry L. Jones is an award-winning international poet, playwright, performance artist, and artist. If I had more vowels, I would give more to what he's been doing. He's been inspired by cultural connections, historical events, personal experiences, and social issues. Uh, Jones del delves deeply into his roots for the tree academic world. His work strives to help people feel and understand the past to heal. His published poetry appeared in locations in the US and abroad. Collaborations of his literary work inspired dance, film, artwork, and plays. Some recent literary activities include inaugural poet laureate of Hendersonville, Tennessee, Artwire Fellow, the Porch Writers Collective, and the Oz Arts Nashville. Lecturer about artwork and poetry, Converge Poet from Mass and Full Fort Negley. Let me take a breath because there's more. There's brother been doing stuff. Henderson Valley Library, um, Hendersonville Library Poet in Residence, Feature Poet Poetry Venues and Cultural Events. He's an interviewer on MP. I think we lost him. Yeah, we'll uh, get him back. No worries. Um, and that'll just be in a minute. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm back now. I don't know, folks. <laughs> I mean, we just started at the beginning. We're going to try one more time. Um, but I think if this, if it continues to happen, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put our, our um, audience sort of going through the going through the works here and you know Henry you deserve you deserve the time and the clarity and all of that so we'll try and move on um but if it happens again then we may if that's okay with everyone we may need to reschedule and apologies for the uh internet gods um and and the evil they they are pronouncing on us today they should but, have made a sacrifice <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> I said it does some sacrifice today, you know, throw a couple iPhones in the river. Or something. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. So let me try and get to the end of this um, uh, visiting artist and writer, because I want to give you all your flowers, my friend. So visiting artist and writer at several universities and cultural centers, editor of anthologies, journals and magazines and judge of poetry slams. He's the author of Tell Me No More Lies run into black blackness feeling my poetic gumbo um 2010 that was 2010 and black skillet blues poetry without cornbread due to release in 2022 lastly uh, but not but not you know last but not least jones is a fisk university graduate and a native from detroit michigan brother jones we are honored to have you with you today and before i even go there I am, we are even more honored that you're joining us today on, uh, on your birthday, on, on, on your new year. Um, and so we really, really appreciate that and, and, and you being with us to, to, to chat today. How are you? 
I, I feel great. I feel honored too, Shaka, for being here, um, being able to speak with you as well, meeting Rob and learning more about the center. You know, anywhere I see so much activity in poetry, I'm like, yes, yes. Because that, that's inspirational for us in other parts of the country and the world. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of work being done in this in this area. Thanks to to Rob and a number of other folks, some some of which are on the phone now, that you know, trying to trying to build it up. As you you and I both know, it's all cyclical, right? You have these areas, it, it gets great and then it dips off and then it comes back around. So we're here right. trying to trying to be consistent. And as you know, to a certain extent is the point of this show. You know, we you know, when the internet does work, um, we have folks, you know, can that can join from all parts, you know, all parts of the country, all parts of the world to uh to experience and walk through poetry with us. So that is uh part and parcel of what we're trying to do here. So, you know, I'm just gonna start off and jump right in, right? Your, your, your bio is chock full of accomplishments, you know, poet, playwright, performance artist. Um, talk to me a little bit about what what which of those accomplishments you're you're most proud of and, and why. Ooh, you know, <laughs> that, that that would that would be like you coming in my home. I'm a parent, we have we have three daughters, and saying, okay, which of your daughters is the, you know, do you love the most? Yeah, I hear you. But I got <laughs> like a dude, are you serious? Uh-huh. I love all my daughters, you know. <laughs> no, but there's some of them get on your nerves though. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's people. You know, you, you yeah. got family members, friends, and of course strangers, you know, uh, you can walk away from strangers. Um I've thought about that because in the past years, years ago when I was um, noticing that I had this attraction for these different expressions in the arts, for whatever reason, I don't know where it came from. I thought I only had to do one thing Mm. and put myself in it. And I know that that word dilettante, you know, someone that half does stuff is always echoed. And um, I remember in college um, is one of these classes of the arts and, um, the professor said, and I don't even remember what artist he was speaking of. He said, oh, he was not a dilettante. And he said, does anyone know what a dilettante? I said, a half-assing. And everybody <laughs> laughed. He was like, well, yeah. Um, that's one of my crazy. Fears. Yeah, because um, I know that when there's a story to be told, you should give it your all. And that's something that, you know, even my, my grandfather, my father, parents in general, you're going to do it, do it well, do it right. Otherwise, don't touch it. So Mm -hmm. when I approach these different elements of the arts, I put my 110% into it, into the expression. A lot of times they overlap. So it's hard to say this one, you know, whatever at the moment is coming through. And that's what I bring out. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting when you say whatever's coming through. I know you know, uh, sort of being an artist, there's a couple of different, you know, avenues that sort of uh, dictate w- when we start doing something, right? We can be commissioned to do something. We can just be, you know, uh, inspired and, and we decide to do something. So, you know, with that being said, you know, there's a number of genres that you that you play into. Like what is, you know, I know you say you give 100%, 100% but then you know, what is going to determine what I, if you get a, a commission, for instance, what, you know, what determines whether or not this is going to be in one form versus, versus the other? Um, hmm. oh, 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 well, the first thing is going to be the client, because if um, okay. someone comes to me and says they want me to paint something, a particular subject, I love it when they say you have creative freedom. You know, I mm-hmm. like I like your style. I like the images you create in the subject matter. And I want you to paint this subject dealing with, I don't know, downtown growth or dealing with um, broken families coming to get whatever, whatever. Right. And that, that gives me joy because I can just bring it out. Now, sometimes a poem may come from that because things overlap often. Um, and the trick for me is to stay focused on that because I have to tell myself, look, this particular thing 
requires so much time, energy, mm. and focus. And that's why I made reference to the daily time because I'm not like a butterfly fluttering here, fluttering there. Well, mm. focus on this, get that done, and then move on to the other. And if something's bridged, I bind them together and bring them both together. Mm. Gotcha. No, that makes that, sense. That makes that a lot kind of sense. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, again, it's I love the fact of, you know, the one thing I, I love about this show is that you get a chance to to introduce yourself to um, folks who can jump over, you know, jump multiple disciplines within within creation. I believe that everyone's, you know, a creative is a creative at heart. Yes. You know, um, you think about like the Greek muses, right? They all have their sort of focus area, but they're all quote unquote muses, you know, un, under the arts. And so I've always, I've always, um, I find it in my, my own area of battling between, you know, here's, here's the something that I want to, you know, I want to express, mm -hmm. you know, how is this in music? Is this in poems? Do I, try, you know, is this um, animation? You know, for me, I'm not as, I'm limited. I'm as, I'm, I'm, li I'm not as, uh, I don't have as many quivers in my, uh, or, or arrows in my, what is it, quiver? An arrow in my quiver, you know. Oh, the, 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 yeah, arrow. the arrows. Yeah, yeah. I don't have as many arrows as you do, right? But uh, you know, it's, I always kind of go back and forth. Like, how do you, how do you figure out which one, which one, you know, which one to go down, or is it just a matter of, hey, what's whatever I'm feeling the most is the is the is is which way I go. But mm -hmm. needless to say, I want to take a step. I want to take a step back, right? So you've got all of these, you know, all of these these skills. Um, for lack of a better word to call them, these, um, you know, these powers. Um, I love, I love uh, Marvel and comics. So I always want to go back to sort of what was your, you know, what was your creation story, right? So how, you know, when you, how did you come about being the, a poet, a painter? Like, how did all of that happen for you? Well, it, it, it's twofolded. One, um, in terms of a painter, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was a portrait artist. So my mm -hmm. parents were divorced and my brother and I would fly down to Dallas from Detroit to visit um, my mother, mm -hmm. grandmother. And I just love to watch her paint. I would try to touch her, her paints, the, the different oils and the brushes and all these things. And she was like, no, 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 just sit there. But that <laughs> major influence, um, and then I was an avid reader because in our families, it, we really read. My father read, mother read, grandparents, aunts, uncles. It, our family on both sides were pro-education and really like, no, you're going to get this, you know. And um, I went through some moments in my education because I tell people, I said, well, I flunked the fourth grade. It's like, what? How do, how do you flunk the fourth grade? I said, well... I shut down and um, and I just wasn't receptive. I was in a different environment. That's when we moved to live with our father and um, I shut down. And basically it was my homeroom teacher, Joan Brown, that I used to show her poems and things I wrote, just stories. Even my own father mm -hmm. didn't know of these things, but she would tell me just keep writing and reading and so forth. And, I love to read, but I would be in the classes and I would not speak up. I would I would be terrified to speak up. And there was this um, there was some barriers that I had to bring down. And eventually they came down with support of family and all and just adjusting. But I kept writing and writing and writing and reading. Um, and I really didn't know I didn't have a title. I didn't know I was writing poetry. I didn't know the stories. It was just. I was hearing things and writing them down. Yeah. To sum it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's more than that. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. And this and so this is from, like you said, this is coming from fourth grade, fifth grade, yeah. starting to, to write. And so when, you know, how did it become sort of, you know what, I'm uh, this is what I'm gonna do, right? You, you know, um that was way, way, way later in college. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, while growing up, I saw a lot of death, and I put it in my mind that if I became a doctor, no one would die. And I've told this story a lot. 
And what happened was that in graduate school, I applied to medical school, got in, was a biology major at Fisk. Loved the science, always loved science, curious mind, did well. And it was at Fisk that I met people that they were poets, this thing called the Fisk Chill. So you can come hang out. Um, Sherry Booker was the editor back then. And I would just listen to them. I said, oh, I'm a poet, because what they're doing is the kind of stuff I do. Before then, in high school, you know, your English class, Shakespearean and all the rhyme and scheme stuff. And there were a few teachers like, oh, I got one, you know, but for the most part, nope. Didn't share in the talent show, anything like that. But I was continued to write. And, um, but at Fist, that's when I say that's when it was brought out. And later, and I was painting too, drawing the images for um, my different studies to prepare for tests. But in graduate school, I kept, you know, you keep meeting people, you know you need to do something or you wanna do something, but you're scared. But you start meeting these people that say, well, you know, fate, the creator, creators, whatever you wanna call it, they put these people in your, along your path to say, you know, you need to rethink this. So I kept meeting all these creative people and my next door neighbor was an artist in the art program at the graduate school. He looked in my room, he said, I thought you were a human physiologist. I said, I am. He said, well, what are all these paintings? I said, I do that just to pull my head <laughs> out, you know? And he said, man, you need to give yourself a chance with art. You are an artist. And yeah. long story short, connected with a gallery. In fact, still friends, the owner of that Carlton Wilkinson in the gallery, first gallery to rep me. And um, I moved toward the, the whole art realm during a time when the arts were slow and difficult, sold work. And I just kept painting because that's what people told me. Just keep painting. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's yeah. And I didn't know what to do. And yeah. at FIS, it was also theater. And, and, and my, because I love to read and I love to just challenge myself, that's why I just kept moving in these directions. And I kept meeting those people that provided direction and even education of what books to read. And anything they told me to read, boom, I brought it in. So uh, there was no stopping. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's courage, right? Knowing that, hey, I've got to, you know, I, I, I have to provide myself for life and then decide, okay, well, I'm going to jump out of this, you know, traditional subject of uh, science and move into this this world. So was there, did you have any, did you go and do any formal training or anything around um, painting or anything like that? Or was it just sort of what your, I think it was, you said your grandmother much in her paint. Her, I didn't have any art classes in um, high school. My high school was a, a magnet school for students interested in going into the health field. Um, at FIS, I had a, the introduction to drawing class with LaFran Ford. And I felt, you know, I, the, the arts department or her office was in the, my part of the lower section of my um, dorm. And um, she was like, young man, do you, do you need a, an elective? I was like, sure. Do you like to draw? I said, yeah. You know, and, and, and see a lot of people, unless you're a science major, and your head, you just got all this reading and, you know, you get to college. I don't care what your major is. You, you thought high school was hard, but you get to college. It's like, oh, gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, thick science books. And, they're, and you're like, we're not going to learn all that. And they're like, no, we're going to complete the whole Learn week. all that. Yeah. So there I was in LaFrance Ford's drawing class. And it was a relief because I had calculus organic chemistry, all these, you know, heavy loaded type um, science class and math, which I love, but you can love something, but if it's a lot of it, it overwhelms you. And um, we were supposed to draw a flower. And I had a test, I remember that first day, Shaka, and she said, all right, guys, pick a flower. I want to see where you are. You said you like to draw a small handful of us. And I picked the flower and I was just drawing. And then I sat it down, I opened my book. I said, I got to pass, you know, I'm thinking I got to pass this test. And she's like, Mr. Jones, yeah. you go start on your flower. And I was like, yeah, I'm done. 
And, and now I've been drawing from grandmother days, all everything, you know, that's, that was just a form of expression. And she saw me, she saw that drawing. She said, you're an artist. And, you know, that class was someone that you kind of want to be an artist or you want to get that, you know, those easy A type electives from students. Right. You know? But she let me continue to draw. And, you know, I drew, but there was always more things to learn. And I learned a lot in terms of shading. Because I remember once I drew this, um, I was in work state at the library and I found this book of these African um, kings and one had this huge garb on and I saw it in the book I drew it then I took it to Professor Ford and showed I was proud of it and I just showed it to her she gave it back to me Shaka with all this red ink I was <laughs> boiling because I didn't want her to write on it because I thought I was doing but the you know it was only years later and I kind of laughed because I kept that I probably still have it in my box what she was telling me to do was correct because the way you look at things. And mm. I, the reason I mentioned her because some of the wording that she said about life and approaching art, it echoed the things that my grandmother said years prior. And um, so she was one of those people when I spoke of meeting certain people, uh, I was going through a rough, rough time and here it was this woman on our campus that she communicated with the world like my grandmother did, and and she's much younger, and her her view and her philosophy of the importance of art, there it was kind of coming back to me, and that message helped me deal with some of the stuff I did, and healed me, and um, so that drawing class it was just not drawing and shading, it was much deeper, and that was part of the foundation of what I needed, and. Um, I didn't have room to take any more art classes, brother. I really didn't. Shaka, I, that was a lot of classes. And, um, but I am friends with her to this very day. She's come to exhibits. Uh, she's still a professor at FIS, influencing so many minds. Wonderful person, uh, that spirit. And we keep in contact. And, yeah. and I think that's what's important, making those connections yeah. with people. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, one of the uh, mantras I always go by, um, you'll see on my site and such, it says, listen different, you know, and it's really about listening to the universe and the things that, that, that are put in front of you, right? So right. I'm hearing you say this story and it's like, no, this was decided, you know, the, the, the office was in, in, in the building that you were already there, you happened exactly. upon this teacher, you know, nothing is arbitrary. That at yeah. least that's my belief, you know what I mean? That's so, um, you know, we just got to listen to the universe and, and hear, you know, wh where it's telling us to go. So this is, this is wonderful. And, and, you know, all of that is, is why we're here, we're here talking today. So uh, I got a couple more questions for you before we, you know, get to you uh, reading for us. But um, you mentioned, you know, in your bio, we talk about um, you work striving to help people feel and understand the past to heal. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about what, what that means to you. I, I wanted to become a doctor, basically to heal people, to save people. And when I made that change, accepted into a research program that I was another love in science, accepted in several medical schools. So that practical route was there. And instead of pursuing that PhD in, in forestry, botany basically, um, because I love outside nature and I was switching nature, some human physiology. I interned with the USD Forestry Service, flew to Mont Missoula, Montana and all along the West Coast I was out, I was loving those mountains. And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can either transfer here, because I was at SIU in Illinois. You can transfer to Mozilla, Montana and get our program or so on, so on. And you know, we'll pay for it and blah, 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 you have a job. I left all that, become a, um, an artist. Because there's two things. I, I noticed that what I was doing was tapping into helping me heal. And then, then mm -hmm. I would have something to offer others. It wasn't this 
commercialized version or me becoming this very sophisticated camera. You say, oh, I can draw that. Let me show you what I can draw. I, so I went from drawing, because uh, LaFran said, you know, you should look into, because she got me an internship with um, at an architectural firm at Kizik and McKizik one summer, because she said, mm -hmm. you need to look into different avenues of the arts. Yeah. You're, you're an artist. No one's ever talked to me about that. So she, I did that one summer. Uh, this Harvard architectural thing, I applied, I got in, didn't go, didn't go. Uh, for students interested in that. Um, what else did I do? Oh, and then medical illustration. My Harry Medical School is right across the street. You know, and illustration, the computers were just starting. The CAD was opening up. I'm aging myself. Mm. Um, <laughs> I was there with you. Yeah, yeah. So I was looking at other jobs, but that is just translate. I wanted something where what I went through, what I endured, plus I was meeting other people that were going through stuff and I'm listening to their stories and I'm taking these in and then I had something for them. And I kept meeting these people as I exhibited and all and, 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 and just seeing how they were moved and feeling their spirits during arts events. And Every time that happened, Chuck, I was, you know, before I was like, are you crazy? Your parents are right. You could be the doctor and still did this. You know, you could have been a researcher and still did. But then I said, no, I got to give it my all. Back to, if you're going to do it, you give it your all. Yeah. You give it your all. And that's why I used to tell young art. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important to pay your bills. No doubt, duh. Um, but what happens is sometimes we will give 100% to a nine to five and then we'd hardly give any work to our arts. And then you, you look up, you look later how much time you've actually, because when you really think something's important, you put your time and energy into it and it will manifest. It will manifest. And that's what I believe. Struggles, yeah, sacrifice, yeah, but it's manifested. And that's why I said, why are you always working? Because I believe if I keep putting my time and energy into what I do, things manifest. Because that to me is faith. Yes. Like that grandmother I spoke of, she used to talk about the very religious talk about the faith of a mustard seed. And then she showed me a mustard seed. She said, This is all you need for anything in life. And because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of grew up in the church, surrounded by ministers, surrounded by all types of spiritual things. But I remember things, messages that sink deeply. So combine all that, the healing I needed the family members that taught me things and how to hold on. Throughout my poems, I'm like, I keep saying, hold on, hold on. Why? Because it's a reminder of me. And I know there's some people out there that need to hear that. And that mustard seed, that faith, but a lot, we don't, we don't, we don't, we give up. We don't keep going. We give up too easily. Right. And so I know yeah. that I, I got a lot to offer. To gotcha. Offer. And when you say we give up now, are you talking people in general? You're talking, you know. Yeah, because look at the way the world is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, you know, growing up, remember, I'm a science lover, love sci-fi, right? Mm -hmm. Another reason to like you, brother. Um, yeah. I envision <laughs> this wonderful future. For instance, I knew I knew at a certain age we'd have a moon base and I wanted to be an astronaut. Right. And I knew since there'd be a moon base, you have to have a way to get to the moon, even though I couldn't be an astronaut because of my glasses back then. I knew later I learned it was something else, but you know, <laughs> but we made Me progress. Um, and they thought it was silly, you know, me talking about that in middle school and stuff. I knew there'd be a moon base and I was going to go to the moon, whatever it's going to be there, I, I, you know, just stuff. So the type of future we could have we don't have the, the, the resources that we have on our planet and the problems we have on our planet. It seems like as human beings, we need to be pushed to the freaking edge before we truly do something. And what happens is when, back to giving up, the crisis comes, we deal with the crisis, but we don't learn how to prevent a similar future crisis. So we become this, 
people of, um, oh, we got a problem, let's deal with it. But not people that we foresee problems, even though we have so much knowledge and we, we get into prevention. It's almost like with health, they say, you need a doctor that deals with helping you maintain health versus just giving you a pill for each symptom. And then some doctors mm -hmm. not specifically even trying to find out why you have that pain. Now just take this pill. So I just take this pill the rest of my life. Sure. And we mm -hmm. see how the, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is. And, um, <laughs> Indeed. Like, yeah, you got to keep taking that pill the rest of your life. So there's nothing right. I can do. Mm -mm. Right. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You just take that pill, you won't feel pain. And if that one works, we're going to give you something stronger. And you see okay. people get stronger. Because we, we, we've given up on that holisticness of seeing ourselves, how we play a part in nature, how we play a part in the world, how we interact with each other. That's what I mean by giving up. And yeah. the, the message is, you go to school, you get a job, you pay your bills, then you retire, then you die. And you're supposed to be happy. Oh, and yeah. you find somebody, have some kids if you want. But that's the, the that little, you know, that little scenario, that picket fence type thing. Oh, you can't get yeah. a house. House is too expensive. So, yeah. but you better pay your bills. You better get a job. You know, thank goodness they're, they're, they're cutting some student loans because people couldn't buy houses, you know? So, yeah. yeah. That's why I say we give up. We give up on dreams, we give up on potential. We we have we have so much to do, but we don't demand that we do. Right, right. We, we yeah, that's right. Because the only thing we're yeah. supposed to do, just stop talking and just go to work, get your check, pay your bills, and the world yeah. will be fine. Yeah. Right? It's absolutely they create you know, <laughs> an environment created, you know, such that you have a reliance on something else other than yourself. Exactly. You know, and you know, not, others. And not even exploring who you are or what you can become. That's never yeah. even talked about. Yeah, no, not at all. It's just, you know, it's just, we just, they just hammer down uh, hope. You know, it's, it's, and this is kind of, this is kind of a little bit left field, but I was watching a, a show the other day uh, called Sandman mm -hmm. that recently came out. Yeah, and I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. But you know, there's a scene where they talk about like, um, I don't want to give it away, but it's almost thinking about the power of thought and where hope played, like what level hope played, and how much power hope had. You know, and so it was just this idea that you know, this idea that. Um, like hope was so hope is more powerful than the darkness, you know. And I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to say this so you can get an opportunity to see it. I don't want to. Oh, I don't want to. I want to see it. I saw the trailer. Yeah. I was like, I gotta see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to spoil it for you, but it what it made me start thinking about is, you know, if this hope, you know, was more powerful than the darkness, mm -hmm. then if you're trying to be a controlling body to keep the darkness, you got to figure out a way to stop the hope. You know what I mean? And if you if you put all of these as you're talking about all these guardrails, stop people dreaming, stop all of that, you know, then hope has nothing that there's nothing to feed off of. Mm. You know what I mean? This keeps yes. it keeps folks in the dark. It keeps folks dependent, you right. know, um, you know, and, and for me, what, how I'm wrapping this back to poetry is that I always talk about and we, we've read it before. We've seen it before where they talk about like when you. When you want to go back into history and understand real history, you list, you study the poets, not the political text, because there's an agenda. Right. You know what I mean? And so, you know, as poets, you're, you're taking from this hope, you're, you're feeding this hope and, and, you know, putting it into sort of what is going on, how you're feeling, what's happening in, in society. Anyway, I could take this and go on forever. I don't want to do that. Uh, one question, I, one more question I have for you and kind of bring it more more forward um before you, before you read for us um inaugural uh, poet tennessee right i have we had another uh, poet on a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about sort of all the pieces that you know went into that happening being the first poet laureate in in a certain area um you know i came in there was already 
you know, uh, there was already a pathway of great uh, laureates before me, and I was kind of standing on their shoulders, so to speak. But talk to me about like how do you how how did that come about being the very first in in a in a city? Well, part of it was just. I mean, I've always done things in the immediate city, but what has happened is that the city is, cons- not somewhat, it, it's less conservative than it used to be, okay? And I've participated okay. in things in the arts, literature and all, and support it. But what tends to happen is that um, I have friends, colleagues in other cities that are doing more so I take my little 15 minutes, even one hour drive to go participate. And I said, you know, I've done things more need to be done here because Tennessee, um, I don't have the stats. There are air, pockets of Tennessee that have a problem with literacy. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Dolly Parton has a wonderful book program, sending books to children and things, numerous organizations are doing things. And I looked in the community and I said, what can I do? So I reached out to um, politicians, literary people and all to say, more can be done. I've done this and all. So they looked into, in terms of poor Lord and all, and it looked into um, my past and things like that and other people and a committee was formed and I didn't hear anything for a while. And then I heard something and said, oh, we looked over this and um, make you the poor lawyer, your best candidate, you know? I was like, cool. And the problem was then, I said to myself, I never said I could win. And then after I win, I do A, B, and C. The problem was, what do I do now? Because I remember that day during the induction and all, COVID was high, couldn't get a lot of people there. The mayor was there, uh, people from the the library system. That's our main literary circle. And, and, you know, it's, I tell other poets when they look for open mic places, I said, look, you got a public library, host your open mics there. Because sometimes Mm -hmm. the cafes and places, if you're not bringing in the people, bringing in the money, um, they're not going to allow you to continue. You know, but libraries, everyone in the library goes there because they love to read or they're looking Mm. for a certain book to potentially love to read. And I've had more success. So I was I felt great there. But then I said to myself, "Ooh, what am I going to do now? Yeah, yeah, I got this. And I knew of some poet laureates in Nashville. And they were doing things similar to what I was doing. So I just kind of expanded on that in terms of programs and things. And the challenge was COVID was at its peak. Oh, yeah. And um, so people couldn't come together. Really Zoom at that time. There were Zoom sessions, but I wasn't I wasn't familiar too much with Zoom at all. So with the help of, um, as the, the, um, the uh, court and residents at the library, the help of the, the video art, we made all these wonderful videos they're on youtube um being outside keeping distance and programs where people basically when you approach the library and all you're like you look down i knew that i had to get people to notice things first right like i had this maze i had these footprints um what else uh, uh, i did for a mosaic never got to that but all the other thing every about every two weeks i was bringing something to that li- and it's a beautiful huge library modern everything and i i would notice people like when they came in the building i said oh I need to put something right there because they're going to walk mm-hmm. right through it they walk through it these are people that love to read but not everyone loves to read poetry is not particularly their genre so i had to kind of right. get them and then i even noticed the number of books in the library, how many poets are. So I, I made a list of other poets that I suggested that the libraries look out for and, and purchase some friends, some older poets. I was like, they don't have, what? And I said some anthologies and all. And um, 
you know, libraries are struggling. And then I, the last thing was to get people to mm-hmm. get a library card, which they haven't started charging because I knew from that, the politics of it, if you're, you own a love library, or they call it a media center now, a lot of places, if it shows that you're acquiring more and more members, that justifies you purchasing more books. So I would tell yeah. people, get your card, get your card. That's going to help them. And then, of course, check out books. Don't just get a card and not be active. Um, uh, so that was another thing that I was doing along the way, getting people all psyched up about poetry. I was there reading poetry from a distance and people, a lot of people kept telling me something I knew they were going to say. These are the older adults, the, the yeah, adults. Yeah. I remember in high school, uh, with high school English, where we had to do all the rhyme and scheme stuff. And I thought to myself, maybe that's where we need to get to. I need to go to these high schools because <laughs> I don't pretend, I don't think I like nah, Shakespeare's cool, you know, but right. you know, other poets. And then Longfellow, you know, it, it, it seems like they need to bring more poets within the curriculum of high school English and, and of course, middle school as well and introduce right. students to a, a, a larger genre of um, larger um, volume of poets. And, and that right. will then create this wider appreciation. But you loving poetry, is that gonna get you a job after graduation? <laughs> See, back to the, just get your education, get a job, pay your bills. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the problem, you know. Uh, I'm still fighting yeah. for that. I'm still doing things and, uh, but, I'm, I'm not letting people not see poetry and not experience poetry because I'm putting it in their face. Yeah, absolutely. In any, in any, in any way you can get it in front yes. of folks. Yes. Um, it changes lives. Well, look, this is, this is, I'm, I'm going to give you some time. We're going to come back to some questions, but I definitely want to give you some time to, to read um, and take us through. I think you're, you're, you're going to read some selections from um, Run Into Blackness, Feeling Up, yes. Pope My uh, Pope. Okay, wonderful. So um, I am going to turn it over to you, Rob. We'll give you the the, the spot um, and uh, do your thing. All right, let's see. This is my book, Run Into Blackness, Filling My Poetic Gumble, that was mentioned earlier. I'm going to share some poems from this book and then my upcoming book, Black Skillet Blues, Poetry Without Cornbread. When I completed this first book, I had this crazy notion that I would publish this one book two years later, maybe a year, a second book of poetry and so on and so on. And I've learned that just like growing things in a garden, it takes time. And I could probably make these smaller chat books and all, but, um, there, was, there were messages that I needed to compile. So right into blackness, I wanna share some of those messages or as I call them, windows of um, different worlds. This first one is titled Little Black Man. Hoping this hour would let me rest in her strong arms. Sleep a while across those warm thighs away from the world which says what I am or ain't, what I can or can't, or what I will or won't be someday. Just a few hours in Big Mama's arms and tomorrow I'll run back to kindergarten. Little Black Man. This next poem is titled, Mary's Love, Mary's Love. She lives, no, she lies. No difference, a letter. Cheap whore, no devoted nun, no difference, both smile. When her plastic face turns away to avoid eyes and deep kisses, her body bleeds inside with the moon, raising desire's tides until ecstasy pours down her legs from the bloody cross onto her bed, leaving a stain when she wakes keeping her mirrors covered with satin to soften the truth that removes the cloth. For another night, makeup hides everything. Then she can forget and start again. (sighs) 
I, I've noticed that with poems, of course, some are harder and some are softer, but you have to have this um, moment of taking a poem in. It's not the length so much, but that breath, that breath. This next poem, my father died in uh, 2002. Lost my mother in 1992 and my father in 2002. And in this book there actually is a poem dedicated to my mother and one for my father. This is 2022 and it hit me that, my gosh, this is 2022 and I start counting. And oddly, I picked up this book. And when I did, because, well, I have all these break marks where I've read. And there was my poem dedicated to my father. And then I felt this pre his presence. My father used to smoke cigars. He stopped later. And I smelled the aroma of cigar smoke. We don't smoke in our house. And I have these odd moments of presence, I call them, and I think that people, loved ones from the other side are reaching out and just saying, I'm here, I'm near. This expression comes from my, um, one of my uncles, uh, Uncle Franklin. And he said, you know, your father died like a prince. And I give you this long introduction, very short poem, but I had to think about what that expression meant. And it became a poem. My father died like a prince. I lumped your death amongst the other deaths I've known, felt. Your face appears at the corners of my eyes as some type of phantom. Then I smell your cigar. I look quickly, hoping to see you again as evidence of the end and beginning. My father died like a prince. This last one is about grits. Food is Someone told me about the, the, the phrase foodie, and I said, oh, I've been a foodie all my life. It's a child that eat a pound of bacon you know, with our babysitters. And she would tell my mother, bring more, you're gonna have to bring more food, Miss Charles, to this child, he just eats. And um, so this poem, Grits, a lot of my poetry deals with food, grits. She refused to eat grits, played with them in her bowl and smirked at her granny, who kept saying, eat them, child, her eyes rolled to the edges where tears slept, wanting to slap the wrinkles from Granny's face, but held her hand back, not knowing the strength of Granny's three generations all in one. So she better not hit her. Eat them, child, eat them, eat those grits. Her ears tried to bend and block the echoes of the old woman, ran out the door, through the yard, down the street, to find a tree to hide behind. Granny could snatch her neck before the other foot would touch the ground. Eat them, eat them, they're good for you. Eat those grits, Granny said. Granny Chanet's chant became old like her skin, dry, wrinkled, full of memories, tracing paths of headstones and births where each line resembled an ageless branch of the family tree. Who knows how many storms have shaken her trunk or tried to break her spirit? You done, Granny asked. Her layered cataracts haloed with an angelic halo, yellow, looked down at the cold nuggets still wanting to be swallowed. They danced along the spoon's edge, running to escape the sharp tongue of the ungrateful child. Her mouth spat and left a trail which slammed, which shamed the arsonist's lust. Only the burnt remains revealed her true intention to purify her granny's desire. Eat those grits now. 
And she asked, why, why, why? Forget the grits, Granny. She only screamed inside her head, fearing the backhand of three generations. The ancient frame trembled as she watched this defiant child, mocking her time and love to make breakfast and feed her. Granny snatched the bowl and smiled, walked to the sink and spooned out each mouthful. The sink belched as it drank water and grits. The girl smiled, watching them, thinking she won. Grits gone, not realizing what she really had. Granny threw away something to keep her strong. Grits. And the last one for the book is titled Libation. You have people to say, let's go out for libation and talk about going out and get drunk, going to a bar or something, get drinking. Um, I connect with the libation ceremony in terms of remembering past loved ones' ancestors. For my, yeah, my grandmother's 80th birthday, my family made this beautiful quilt um, where we, each family, added a, um, a square. And then my Aunt Nancy assembled, well, she might have had help, but she has a mad, she has mad sewing skills and she um, put this quilt together. And anyway, I enjoyed that libation ceremony. And I said, let me write a poem. Do your memories easily flow from your mind? Let your spirit go. A small death, free to roam, to touch, to know yourself. Be and become, reach for truth and answers by listening to ancestral voices that echo between the drips of water poured in a libation. Those drips are tears. Never forget your ancestors, ancestors. Never, never forget those libations. Now I'm going to share with you Poems from Black Skillet Blues, Fortune Without Cornbread. Yep, gumbo. Why not have cornbread, right? This poem is titled, We Are. We are. Who and what are we? We are painful memories, dreams stolen, wake up, rose to remember, faces from our stories, full ladles poured, lies for grieving comfort in a better place now. Wind of vultures circling, wind of death rising, wind of tears falling, another sacrifice given. It's just their place, it's just their way, we say, it's just their way to protect their world. We are moving targets. Silhouette shout, bull's eye, killed by defa default. Trophies from the hunt, barking dogs run off, scent of historical pride. Get them boys, find it. Streams of bullets shot, streams of hatred shot, streams of fear shot, another sacrifice justified. It's just our way, they say. It's just our way to stand our ground. We are hanging meat, butchers hacking, this enough, washed in blood, flesh welcome shame, climaxing faces, twisted sorrow and hit, hidden denial, it's over, now rest. Birth of mixed blessings, birth of shaded lies, birth of new chattel, another sacrifice hidden. It's just the way we say it's just the way to protect the nightmares of who and what we are. When you see this book, Black Skiller Blues, this is gonna be the first poem that you hear, that you read, Cornbread. Cornbread memories of the skillet, brown and black edge, winking at me, making me smile. 
while watching the butter glide along the yellow surface, dripping into the sink holes made by toothpicks to parsley soak the inside with a sweet and salty flavor, almost cake-like. Cornbread made us black folks hungry to be cooked in the hardness as the temperature rises, getting slightly burned on the edge, but keeping all the flavor inside, just enough heat to transform your inside and make firm, keep you whole and full. A spiritual food made to feed the soul with strength that made us survive. Cornbread. James Baldwin, one of my favorite authors. This came from um, an art wire, the art wire uh, program that was mentioned earlier. Baldwin speaks of old and new lynches. I'm gonna have to watch the time. When just above my head a lynching, seeking relief from grieving eyes, leaking slowly in disbelief, racing hypertensive heartbeats, Fear in my chest pounding loudly, beats to our African ancestors, sounding like distant drums, awakening the deep slumber, listening to those ancient chants, scores of music that seem familiar. Dry branches applaud the wind, moving like praising to the word, clinging to our old star notes coded, echoing on the Nile's currents, catfish dance in depths muck. From Egypt to Mississippi woes, trying to find hidden bodies still, wanting the sorrow to end now, looking with blurry, heavy eyes, a sea of salty cries falling never dry. Will we ever mop up all the blood, staining history's pages, crimson and black, raising our children as Kwanzaa corn, missing still many snatched burned ears. They sizzle in the raging fire as they rise. Smoke twirling up, signals pointing, showing children the way home. Searching for lost souls in limbo, knowing mass graves are still hidden by the twisted hearts of demons. We only desire a fearless darkness. Counting the names in police records, watching the video footage of blue lies, allowing the rapid dogs to storm free with desire to hunt more black meat. Trumpet blows a new Harriet's glory, running through concrete and steel, telling weary eyes, keep moving, mourning stunted mind she left behind to live on smiles and shuffle dances. When their butts get tired and cramped, twerking along to see another day, longing a white cloth savior loves them, reaching for threads tied to their necks, then thicken into a noose for a picnic. Erected another native son, proud day, dragging flesh from his slave bones, banging on plantation floor, the rapes, castrating tails to stop the black seed, dry, thin lips shouted about new trophies. When stuffed heads hung on the walls, stirring old hunt memories for sons, climaxing semi-automatic penises shoot emptying hatred onto dirty, lusty sheets with uncovered heads and proud smiles. Now screams about their rightful place, waving Confederate pride in the sun, standing their ground a fearless old glory, bringing loads of cotton to more flags, hemp fibers to write a new constitution. When Baldwin, the old pastor's son, Watches blacks pull the weave apart, revealing their frailty and strength. Trapped naked beast in the flower garden, clothed in sermons for marching plans. Around the world, loud outcries for justice, walking unstoppable weaves, waves of change, holding up signs for all to hear our voices, seeking proof of humanity 
to redeem. Now, the fire next time is freedom's glow. I just completed a, um, a program with the Converge Center where we, um, uh, Siona Rose and I, with two ports, we went to Fort Negley, which was one of the largest forts in Nashville uh, during the Civil War. And there we were interacting with people, guests, they're trying to expand the fort to make it more um, historical, and interactive for the public and bring people in. Because you know, not everybody likes history. But then if you find a way to get people excited about history, they're gonna to wanna to come, they're gonna to wanna to participate and support. Um, this is one of the poems that I wrote, got those impressions. Um, it's titled, We Fight to Win Fort Negley Incident. We fight to win. Nothing else matters. Your right is my wrong. Our blood is voiceless. As it flows through two rivers, redemption to lo is lost in our streams. Bodies piled like kindling, awaiting the reaper to collect and dry for the fireplace in hell. Forsaken souls reach for relief. No one told them the fire burned so deeply. It still felt century later lost in the fury of what you believe. One side to free a nation of fame, shame, the other to fill a nation with fear. Both leaves tracks of blood, footprints wanting to walk back home, weak but still stumbling to achieve a glory. War games played without sticks and stones, soldiers realize memories of home will fade. As they slip away to meet dead loved ones, loved ones, tightly grasping the sacred black powder, which is eclipsed the sea, the sight of peace, stuffed in a barrel with a message. Let the lead weigh down the bodies, keep them dead if we keep shooting. Our thunder sent across tall grasses. We fight to win, nothing else matters. Your right is my wrong. Freedom sacrifice is still being paid, written on history's crimson pages. I'm going to keep track of time here. This poem um, was recently accepted, speaking of war, um, in the 2022 edition of the Word Peace Journey Journal. Uh, their summer fall issue. It's about Ukraine. It's titled Old Wounds, New Wounds. The Russian bombs exploded outside, making my windows widely rattle like angry wind chimes in a windstorm. Glass shattered and fell onto the floor. I jumped under the kitchen table, holding onto its legs like a frightened child, grasping tightly around mother's calves. Instead, I was alone. As black smoke drifted inside, covering me with ash, I coughed out the smell of burned rubber and imagined my mother's hairy bird legs. Those legs ran fast when we were frightened. She'd lift me up, hold me close and run as I felt her warm breath in my face. Her heels stomped faces of cobblestone while looking for a place for us to hide. This is why now I dove to hide and wait. Remembering the smell of her perfume covered my face resting in her lap, reminding me of the colorful wildflowers growing along Lake Yapu's shore where I played and felt safe with her. I could feel her strong arm holding me, preventing me from being washed away. Now, instead, I smell the pungent aroma of burned rubber, flesh, and wood, and hear distant cries echoing outside. Ukraine doesn't feel safe without her. The child is gone and mother's dead. I'm alone an old man in war, 
holding these mahogany table legs, Death's cold tibia bones for security, like a frightened child looking for reassuring eyes would say, everything's going to be fine. Then I'd smile, believing those words, take a deep breath and sleep all night. My childish eyes peep framed in wrinkles, visions of nights turn into nightmares. Fear turned me cold and into shock. Then I heard people calling out. The explosion stopped finally. My dry lips found spit to whisper. And then a hoarse shout, I'm alive, save me. And then able to shout louder, I'm alive, in here, I'm alive, save me. And kept shouting holding those legs of my mother. That's all I could do with my stiff arthritic fingers, waiting for them to find me as my tears flow down my face in the etched memories of other wars. I think I need to check in. Rob, how am I doing for time? You're doing good. Okay, fabulous, fabulous. This next poem is titled, The Holes I Have. This was um, featured in um, chapter 16 of the Tennessee Humanities publication. The Holes I Have. A soft light reflects on my walls, filling the room with cheerful dancing silhouettes. Images tracing along the hidden places flood my brain along these holes in my head called eyes. These strange creatures soar through the pinks, blues, whites of the covers. Quilted happiness to the strands and stories heard each night of places and people. Then warm kisses good night echo in my mind through the holes in my head called ears. Now old, drinking brandy, full-bodied, a calm invades my bones with warmth, bringing a hush, a contentment, like those stories. Drinking nectar to rain on the castles in my mind, playful games kill the dragon flowing inside, through the long gutter in my head, caught a mouth. Years of the living, the dead, the hushed, the moving. Ancient winds blow across my face, scent of old lies. Becoming a dry desert, once salty oceans of plenty. Aromas persist along the flowing currents, rye from the fields, roses on the bush, strings of honeysuckle through these downward holes in my head called a nose. The sights, sounds, tastes, and smell of you from those years. Surrounding me, inspiring me to paint an unseen image. Many pictures we played and relived, but longing for you. Those things which I have yet to see or feel for many years. I peek back at those moments, wondering what to do now with the hole in my chest where a heart once pounded for you. I mentioned that we have um, we have three children. I don't know why I had to think about that. We have three. And I was there for the birth of each of them. It was, just, oh my God, I, I, you know. Um, it was amazing, it was amazing. And, you know, every day um, I look at them and I think when you, you look at someone that you knew that was tiny, maybe slightly bigger than a loaf of bread, then they're tall, they're adults, because they're adult now. It's, and you think back, it's like, how did that happen so quickly? So when I see parents, I say, 
new parents, I say, don't blink too long because they're going to grow up. And don't miss any moments. Don't miss any time to spend with each other. Because that the quality does outweigh the quantity of, of being together. So I'm going to read this last two. Um, this is a poem. Let me end with that. Yeah, I'm going to continue with this. Remember the message. Um, and it's, it's a message. I have these poems where I've, I say, okay, what if I die? What poems would I want my daughters to know as a message about life and all? They're going to read all this stuff or see things, but I want specific. So remember the message is one of those poems. Our children are supposed to do better than we did. This is why we walked no march like soldiers determined to see a change, the needed change, with the stories and memories of who sacrificed so much for us. Their blood on our hands, like a birthmark covering our fingers, pointing at the past with crimson ends, where we can see the blackened colors trapped under our fingernails, where strength hides, waiting to be used to do one thing. Dig at those roots as we strive with all our might. While at times becoming weary, we hear from the echoes of the past, ancestors scream to us, sounding like a ringing in our ear, or maybe it's just the wind, but not from an infection, but conviction. Their message is simple. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And we discover we can and we must. So remember that message, my child. And the last poem is along this way. I'm a lover of journeys. I love to go hiking. We've gone on hikes. And I mentioned I love nature. This poem was accepted for um, actually a calendar program. Uh, Murfreesboro Majesty, uh, Murfreesboro Majesty. And uh, in X also this poem was part of the Art Wire program where basically to sum it up uh, as a fellow, uh, there were these performances at Oz Arts Nashville, dances, music, uh, concerts, and so on. And um, I saw this particular dance during COVID, but they pulled it off. It was beautiful. Can't recall the company now, but this poem came from that, that inspiration of seeing this one of those uh, performances along this way. Heavy burden pulling inside and outside, holding on while stepping on crisp grass, making a new path for others to follow. Hunters looking for easy prey, children for searching for their homes, lovers sharing in nature's grace. This struggling day brings tight shoulders, walking on a trail of colored breadcrumbs, a loaf of memories crumbled in my arms, hands reaching for rancid connections, Fingers grasping at starving, straying fibers, palms holding onto abandoned self. An old scarecrow mounted in a cornfield, nibbling at the air, grasping for breath, singing whispered songs as crows circle, eyes wanting to see lucid dreams, head hurting from bright sunlight, neck straining toward a different journey. Thank you for listening. I hope your journey will take you to the path where you need to be. Don't be afraid to try anything that you have a dream for. And, um, even if it's not in the arts, if it's in the arts, hey, it's even better. Um, but um, I appreciate you being here and taking the time to share and celebrate my birthday. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm Blah blah blah. Years old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I love it. And definitely happy, happy birthday, happy, happy New Year, as I always say. Um, your your work is 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 um, you know, amazing. Is 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 too circle level a word to 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 use. So I, I appreciate you sharing with the audience here. I appreciate with you sharing 
uh, the work to the future audience who listens to this later on. Um, there's so much, there's so much compacted in there, and there's so much, um, and I, I hate to say it this way, but that's the only way I can say it. There's so much soul, right? There's so much, I think that word is overused, um, but it's sort of what comes out. I hear so much, you know, you, you even in the conversation, you mentioned your art, you've mentioned, you know, your, your grandmother, the, the quilt, like all of these, all of these ingredients. I think of it like a, you, you got me hungry because you're talking about food all the time, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's like this pot you know, and all these ingredients that you're, you're, you're putting in there that, that sort of, you know, make this, this you um, so amazing. And by the way, your poem brought my internet back. So there's that part of it as well. Um, so I got a couple questions for you just about the book and then we go through sort of what we, what we call our, uh, what I call my rapid fire, things that I do every, every um, interview. But, you know, when I'm thinking about about uh, you putting the book together, def definitely running into blackness. So what, how did you come about choosing the poems for that? You mentioned in the beginning, you were saying, you know, um, it's like growing, right? Seeds, you mentioned before about your grandmother and the mustard seed, right? So when you're, when you're saying, okay, I'm gonna put this book together, how does, how does that happen? It, it, it was a nightmare, <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, seriously, because I hosted open mics in Chicago and I brought in different poets that had books. I even did desktop publishing. And so I've seen the format, but when it came to what I wanted in my book, because people, what, where's your book? I said, well, I have this chat book and the chat book wasn't large at all. It's just something I was like, yeah, I need to do this. I need to have a book. Yeah. And then I was like, you can do more. You got a lot of poems, you know? So mm -hmm. running the blackness was that journey. And it was a nightmare because I really wasn't sure how I wanted to present it. Mm. And then I put in my mind, I don't know what was going on health wise, but I said, okay, if I drop dead, what would I want in this book? I mean, I'm just telling you, I know. What would I want in this book that people would say, oh, he's a poet, and they pick up the book and they could see most of the, um, my, my, my styles, my, my images and topics. And I, I moved all those poems around. I decided to structure them based on chapters and subjects and subjects that either I experienced or, or again, um, people that I met in mm. terms of uh, identity, you know, things that people have issues with. Some of those poems dealing with that. Don't like ourselves being black. Anything but black, you know. I painted a picture about that, that and anything but black. And I, in fact, I have a, a second one, a smaller version, anything but black too, um, because I knew that that book represented me when I couldn't be there. Because mm -hmm. you know how it is, Shaka. With poetry, people prefer to hear it, but there's going to be poetry that, for whatever, well, pre Zoom age. You couldn't get the people. So you had the poet's book. Yeah. You would have to, and if you've never heard the poet's voice pre-YouTube or any video, you'd have to imagine what that poet, unless you were fortunate to see the person in person and right. hear that poet right. uh, recite. Um, so I, I just said, this has to represent me. And these are some of the things I'd like to talk about. These are some of the things I experienced. So uh, I put them together. And I said, this is too much, this is not enough. And I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And then just like this second book, cause 2022, mm -hmm. I think it was due out in 18. I have to look at my notes cause it's, but I've, I've learned that there were experiences in our world that I need to put in the second book. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I stopped beating on myself and saying, you were late. No, 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 there were some things needed, some connections. Yeah. And I did come across the last poem recently um, at an event. And I said, this is it. That's what I was waiting for, yep. to say, complete. You're ready to share. Gotcha. No, yeah. that's, that, that, that's amazing. I, mean, I think the same, my first book, I, uh, and this is before I had children, before I was married, any of that stuff. I just, similar to kind of what you were saying, I thought of like, if I'm not here, mm -hmm. I want to leave something for my child. Right. I always knew I was going to have to, I just didn't, you know, again, it was, it was young. And so I said, what can I leave that's tangible? Because when I was coming up, you know, 
if you were doing a, if you had product, it was a CD. Right. And yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, I want something that, that, you know, now it's she with my daughter, but I said, you know, my child can rifle through that can actually touch, you know, and, and, and have it in hand. Um, and that was like the, that was the impetus, right? It was just like, I got to write, you know, whatever happens, I've got to, I've got to do a book. So, um, you know, I can, I can definitely relate to that. If I'm not here, what do I want to, you know, what do I want to leave behind folks? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that being said, you mentioned your daughters. What is, what does your family think of, uh, of your work, of your, of your writing? <laughs> I love this question. You get yeah. This? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was this poem? Um, uh, they are honest, which I appreciate. <laughs> uh, when friends or strangers come to me, and say, oh, I want you. And I, I say, I will be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And because if someone says they care about you, you don't want them to lie to you. Right. I, told, I, I told a friend of mine, I said, you have to have booger friends. I said, what? I said, because a friend will say, whoa, 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 you got a booger hanging out your nose. You can't go out there in front of those people. Right. Wait a minute. That's right. So your friend will give you real feedback in terms of your presentation and all and what you're trying to say. And my family, um, they've given me positive, for the most part, they, they look at it and um, I'm trying to remember this poem because my youngest was looking at it and I saw her eye tearing up and I was like, and we have allergies. So I don't know if that was after yeah. reading the poem or she was so moved, but I'd like to think the latter, um, <laughs> you know, but they, they give me honest feedback mm-hmm. and, um, and so most of the time, yeah, they're, they're on point. Sometimes I'm like, mm. <laughs> Maybe I need to add more, you know, because I mean, you know how it is you're writing and you want to say, is this what I'm trying to say? Right. right I'd have right. to put it down and come back to it. Yeah. But eventually you get to where you need to be. So yeah. it's ready to um, share with people the right yeah. words, the right images. But they, they, I mean, our family, we girls grew up in the arts, acting in theater. Our youngest is now playwright. Um, she went to school to college for that. And I was like, whoa, oh you didn't, you're not gonna go into this major then change like that. I love that, you know. <laughs> so I went to um, um, uh, University of Arts in Philly and honors and all that, and doing well with programs and so proud of her and the others, even though they did not major in the arts, they're still doing things in the arts. And yeah, yeah. they still, shocking, they call, man, dad, I read this blah, 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 blah. And they go to, uh, receptions, dances, all the things that we took them to. Because one thing my wife and I said, if we can't bring our children, we won't go. I hear. And, and our children were very well behaved, especially at the art reception. They, they'd be like, what did y'all do? And they'd be looking at art and they'd be talking about it. Because yeah. in our home was stuff like that, the books. Yeah, yeah. Discussions. Yeah. You know? yeah. They yeah. were silly and all that too, but they truly love the and I, I always say to people to have a true appreciation of the arts it truly it does start at home just like I said early on about the love of reading I became I love to read because my grandparents love to read my parents love to read my uncles and aunts love to read and we talked about such thing you know and the passion for education was there uh, and that's why I said we ain't trying hard enough <laughs> so as a people, you see what I'm saying? I'm getting back to, but we got yeah. more. Rec- I, we had Encyclopedia Britannica. We, you know, we got more. We should be speaking. Each of us should be speaking six right. or more languages mm-hmm. now. We're really exactly. fluently, fluently. <laughs> exactly. Think about it with the resources yeah. we have today. I tell, I tell them all the time. I tell them, you know, talk to my daughter, and I'm just like, you know, this was. I remember we went to a store the other day, and they had a piece of furniture that they were selling, which was a card catalog. And from the library, and I told my oh daughter, my gosh. I was, "Yeah, I was like, you know what that is?" And she's like, "Yeah, furniture for something with little drawers, you know, with that <laughs> like the Dewey Decimal." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like this is not this is not a jewelry box thing. <laughs> and, you know, you. I was like, we had to. There was no internet. There was no Google. You had right. to pull the drawers open and look at the do. Find the card. 
to see yeah. where it is and then go find it in the library. And I was just yeah. like, so um, yeah. it's the environment, you know, it's the environment that uh, that we're in. You you sitting there and watching your grandmother paint. Yeah. You know, we don't think about it at the moment, but like just being there and seeing how uh, she potentially is visual, you know, seeing something and then visualizing it or taking something out of her mind and then putting that on paper. That's, you know, uh, you, you you grow up with that. And then hopefully this is the things that you pass to, your, you know, to your children and such, at least what I'm what I'm trying with with the sum of my with the sum of our experiences, as they say, you know. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions, then I'm gonna run right into our, our session here. So um actually no, I'm just gonna jump into it. So this is where I do this in in, in most of most of the interviews and such, but um and I love to see where it goes. Um situation, I'll lay a situation out for you. You're in an elevator, you're stuck in an elevator for three hours, right? But you get to pick the three people in that elevator with you, past, present, future. You've got three hours to be with these three people that you would never, ever get a, an opportunity to be with, but you're going to be with them and stuck in this elevator for three hours. Who are those three people? And I can pick their brains. And oh, oh absolutely. There yes, to them. They there for three hours. You've got, you've got their full attention. Mm. Three hours. Let me see here. Well, okay. There's an Egyptologist that I learned about in college. In fact, I was on a committee. We helped bring him to our school to talk about ancient Egypt. And I, I, be, I started buying his books and still have some. Dr. Ben. Dr. Uh, ben. He, he's yeah. one of them because he led a very long life. And I, about a month ago, I was looking up like his marriages and stuff. You know, you know people on their works, but then you you learn like the yeah. marriages and kids and all. And yeah. I was like, because I, when I see people, I'm like, did their kids carry on with that? I call it the legacy thing. Because mm -hmm. I talk to other artists and I wonder what it will take for our children to continue a legacy, not to do what we're doing, but to uh, find themselves, yeah, their right. identity, yeah. perhaps in a similar field. And um, it's just a wonderful, it's just not like build a store and you want your child to keep building, maybe have a franchise of stores or something. But Dr. Ben would be one um, because I would want to know what more he would want to have done. I didn't realize how many books he had written. I only knew of three that I have. And um, just his other experiences because he had just a great storyteller. Um, James Baldwin. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, James Ball wouldn't be another one because I have most of his except one. And um, that is someone I just wanted to meet and just sit down over coffee uh -huh. and not have him smoke and, and listen <laughs> to him. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not into smoking, but anyway. Um, is that, do I, am I supposed to pick one more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got Dr. Ben, you got James Baldwin. You know who I, I, I painted a picture titled Harriet Tubman's Womb. And some of my images are biomorphic in mm -hmm. nature. They, you know, they resemble, and that's just something that's in me, it's gonna come out. Harriet Tubman, even though I think there are historical figures that are, I don't wanna say cliche, but they're over, they're over used. Yeah. Used over mentioned and you know but that is someone just I'd love to just sit down and talk to if I could because mm -hmm. uh, I was fascinated with her strength and her endurance because let's face it if you were a slave back then and what was done the brutality you're like yeah. let's keep going <laughs> we're out of that I'm situation not going back. what I'm not going exactly. back <laughs> exactly See, you know we might get caught Right. Yeah, caught now. Right. <laughs> Continue on. We won't be caught. Right. What is right. and and you know, I think that'd be an interesting play because sure, Harriet wanted to, but you know, people are working in groups. He she gets all the credit, but let's face it, there was probably a group of people, and mm -hmm. let's say there were 20 people, and Shaka, you know, 
maybe five said, okay, Harry, we're with you. The other's like, we left to get away, not yeah. to go back. <laughs> we love them, but they got to fight. Because that's, as human beings, there's, there's selfish people in the world. Yeah, yeah, like yeah they could have come Everybody's up. all heroic and trying to save others. Right. No, there's some selfish people. Right, and, exactly. Know, and and the, even though you went through pain, don't mean that you you empathize with others going through mm-hmm. that same thing. Some folks mm-hmm. are selfish, like I got out, you find your own way. You yeah. know, I went through it. You you figure your way out. Yeah. Right. But Harriet, I would just love to pick her brain just to see what she was as a child. Because when you reach that point of wanting to help people, um, when you've gone through something difficult, like there's Harriet and her counterpart, Margaret. No, I have a cousin named Margaret. I don't want to use her name. Uh, Mary. Uh, Mary said, oh, hell no, I'm not going back. <laughs> and Mary's like, Harry's like, we must go back. Right. You know, yeah. We can. Yeah. Get, if the more we go back, if it's enough of us, we can get more people. I've shown you how I did it to free you guys. Yeah. And we could do like a chain reaction. That's right. All, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I would really want to know what she experienced, the people in her lives that that made her that type of person that said, yes, I must go back. Yes, yeah. Mary's like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go where they tell me where I can be safe. Exactly. I had too much of this. Yeah, no, I think it, it's so funny. You see, it's, it's funny to hear that because I, I, you know, I see that. And then there's this other part of it for me. Maybe this is too many clicks down. But, you know, folks who do that, that, that kind of work, like, what's their relationship with death? Like, how do they... You know what I mean? Because yes. you have to have some kind of like, I do not fear this thing, you right. know, right. to put exactly. yourself back in these situations, right? Yes. And so I would love to to sort of understand that 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 dynamic of, and what triggers, you know, how do people get to that place where they're just like, look, there's there's this death thing, and then there's this thing I got to do. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. Because when you speak of soldiers in any army. You're like, well, you were trained to do that. You're supposed to go back. Right, you know? right. You weren't right. wounded. You know, yeah. you don't get a reward. Go home. Right, you, right. You got all your parts, supposedly your mind, even though you're killing people. Right. Um, but they send you back in. But that's your job. But right. a regular person. Right, see right. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's incredible to me. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So then this is the last part. And then I think that there may be a couple of questions in the in, in the chat. Since I jumped over to um, to the computer, I, like that. The computer, I might have I might have um, missed a couple of things, but um, you know, Rob, you help me out with, with if there were any questions behind. But this last part that we're gonna do is what I call my quick fire round, and I'm just gonna say I have some words. I'm gonna say some words. I want you to say, you know, one or two words. Nothing, ideally, just one word, but the first thing that comes to your mind, right? Okay. Uh, after I say that word. Okay. First word, poetry. Endurance. Language. Um, liquid. Art. Life. Concrete. Jungle. Canvas. <laughs> Happiness. <laughs> the stage. What was that again? Stage. Like the, the stage. stage. Peace. Mm. Yeah. Sculpture. Mm. Um, death. Mm. Joy. Family. Black joy. Family. Woman. <laughs> joy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll um, keep it. I'll keep it PG. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> I'll keep it real. Um, loss. Sorrow. Slavery. Anger. Paint. Well, I, I have to say it because it popped in my mind. The first thing, joy. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. Smile. Thing, babies. Pain. Mm. Sorrow. Religion. Hope. Hip hop. Mm. Together. Soil. Mm, food. And the last one, hands. Say it again. Hands. Hands. Oh, embrace. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I, that that's one that yeah yeah i love it i love it um let me check real quick and see oh there's one question that was in the um chat from the audience this is going back to where we were talking in the beginning uh do you have any words about the emphasis of stem curriculum over steam s-t-e-a-m uh, curricula um steam i guess is a uh, science tech engineering arts and right um, yes, this is a liberal arts school. And I remember during orientation, they said, you know, regardless of your major, you, you when you attend the liberal arts school, mm -hmm. you become a well-rounded person. And they explain how, you know, it's your biology major, which I was, you could attend another school where you wouldn't acquire those liberal arts programs. And I, and, and that gave you this, the aim is to a greater view or holistic view of cultures and things mm -hmm. and how they meet. And, you know, I mean, I have no doctors. Right? We have some doctors in our family. And especially now when we have influxes of people for whatever reason coming to different countries, you need to know people mm -hmm. and, and who they are, their culture, their traditions and all. And I think that helps versus just seeing a body a broken body, a wounded body as a machine. And my job is to repair it. Because yeah. uh, there are certain things you wouldn't do, certain people you don't touch, certain ways. Even different cultures, some cultures, people, they, they, they communicate closer, some further yeah. apart, mm -hmm. and so on. There's a whole list of things. Now, of course, liberal arts aren't going to teach you that, but it will teach you, and it may, I don't know. Um, it will teach you, though, um, the 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 humanity of the world versus mm. just focusing on tech. Gotcha. And I think that's the goal of the arts in general, to remind us of our humanity, mm. how to be humane, and being in touch with ourselves. And I love science, but believe me, there is no formula from organic from chemistry that's going to help me get in touch with who I am as a human being. Wow. It'll help me understand the biological forces in me. Wow. But that is a, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. STEAM versus STEM. You need the A to uh, bring the S-T-E-M together, like a hub of the wheel. Yeah. But when I hear that, I'm like, why wasn't it STEAM from the beginning? <laughs> you know, we're not all going into, you yeah. know, it needs to be STEAM, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. Because I mean, even thinking about like, you know, innovation, yeah. there's got to be something that sparks that in the first place. And it's not mechanical, right? right? It's the right. thing that happens first that then, you know, you use that mechanical to, to create or whatever the case may be. But without that, uh, there's no, you know, there's, there's nothing feeding. Exactly. That's, that's so, that's so, yeah, because my, my little one's in the STEM school as well. And so it's one of the things that I, you know, definitely want her being, of course, the, you know, the sciences and such, she does well there. Um, but that's the one piece I, I do wonder about because the, the A is not, is not there as much. I mean, they do try and like work that through, um, through the assignments and such in a way that it's presented. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but yeah, yeah, you know, there's that, that critical thinking that I just want to make sure is in that, is in that, is in piece of that as well. And history has shown that previous inventors and, and well, inventors and, and, and various people that are classified as geniuses, they speak of the power of the imagination mm. of creativity, right. tapping in the dream. So you can acquire the knowledge of information, but it's still the mind that creates so you can you can we can pump your head, fill your head up with all formulas or all engineering, whatever, mm -hmm. and mathematics and so on. But the creativity of, like you say, you're looking outside or you're seeing things, or even hearing a song that might stimulate things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can know it sparks that creativity that leads to this wonderful invention. Sure. And that's also, I mean, you know, also on the other side of it, you can build a boat, but if you have no desire to go anywhere. 
<laughs> that boat is sitting in the dock. There you go. Beautiful design exactly. boat, you know. There's exactly. another question here from Robert. Does a, does a work demand that you change its presentation? For example, a poem has to be presented as a painting. Yes. Yes. Um, I flipped those. Well, a poem has inspired a painting and vice versa. The, the, cause I, I see whether it's writing or creating art, I'm presenting images. Mm. So whichever pulls out the images that I'm trying to share is the direction I should go. Gotcha. And of course, visual art is nothing but, it. I mean, literally images, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I get it. I would say, yeah. you know. But I, I paint abstract stuff, so it's kind of hard for people. I want people to dig and say, like, why don't you just do representation? Like, That's not where I went from mm -hmm. that to this bizarre, colorful thing. And what gets me is when people, they don't have this drive-through mentality. This is what I want, blah, 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 blah. They, they look and they say, whoa, whoa, is that this? And, you know, it's almost like, what, where's Waldo and all that? I'm not yeah. deliberately trying to hide things, but what I create, they, the figures and colors, the association of those, they have a deliberate story. There's a story there, but it's not such a way that you see it and, oh, that's about so-and-so. That's, you, you gotta connect, find a connection. But yeah. I, I tell people, once you find a part of it and you follow it, you're gonna see what I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah. You gotta work. You gotta work. You gotta work. I do yeah. I tell them it's like, yeah, I can do this, and you, you know, you can, but that's a description. You know what I mean? That's 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 a, a you know, um, yeah, that's that's a diagram. Right. You know, I can give you a diagram, but I mean, we gotta work at this, and that's that's as 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 we all know, right? It's you, you want to learn something, you know, if it's harder to learn when you get it, it stays and it sticks. You know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, look, Henry, this has been this has been fantastic. This has been um, enlightening, amazing. I once again want to thank you for spending your your New Year uh, with us here and with the audience here. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, you know we've 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 sort of interacted here and there, and been brought together by the Black Poet Laureate. But uh, you know, this is this is for me my impetus to you know reach out more to um, um, to troll you more, <laughs> and I welcome you, <laughs> folks to uh, find out more about about Henry Jones. Not not only what you've you've heard here, um, and hopefully you're able to sort of uncover some things here. But uh, the gentleman's work is incredible, um, and it spans multiple genres. So it is worth your while. Uh, again, thank you for the time. Uh, thank you for for giving us parts of you not just today, but in, in your work, brother. And, and uh, thank you, Shaq. Remain continued success in the past. So they're going to close the show up. I don't know, Rob, if you have any, any um, parting words uh, for us. Um, but if not, um, again, thanks. Thanks to Poetry Center San Jose uh, for partnering with this. Thanks for everyone who is here today listening and uh, folks future listening. Um, later on, and, and thank you for the uh, internet and Wi-Fi gods for for working with me. Again. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was a little spotty, you, us down. And, you know, but it, it it worked its way out. Uh, but look, you have a wonderful a wonderful rest.